so, what does that mean? Well, is there such a thing as a duplicate field validator? Not really, right? There's none of those seem to fit the bill. So therefore, we can't validate it. So what do we do? Okay, we let the error happen. We let them go and try to update it because it would be a pain to try to write the code to validate that. So we let them try it. The database will not allow it to happen. So we let the update try to happen. It fails, and but instead of giving some ugly error message that's incomprehensible to the user, we pop up something that says update failed, and maybe we put on there possible causes and then describe what the causes are. All right? So in this one example, we have sort of two of the strategies that we can take as far as handling errors. One is we put validation so that the error doesn't happen. They can try, but the problem is caught before the actual error occurs. By error, I mean database error. That's what we did with the required field. We put in a validator, so now, if they try to save something that doesn't have a department name, the validator catches it before it tries to go and update the database. However, it's not easy for us to do that same thing with duplicate rows. So you know what? We let them try it. We let the, the SQL statement execute. It ain't going to work, and we're there to handle the error gracefully. All right. The third way to do it is not even allow them to do something wrong. And, and the best example of that is where if you had like a true or false field, you put a checkbox there, right? You can't have a wrong answer if there's a checkbox there. Or you put radio buttons or you put a drop down. And we won't see that in this example. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. If you had more than one field on that, uh -huh. I noticed that, that when you clicked at it, that expanded. Right. And you, if you put like a validator control on every one, it would just. Yeah just get bigger. And again, I could do things to format that if I wanted to, but yeah, in a nutshell, yeah, that's what it would do. So let's review this. What did we do to make this happen? First thing we did is we went into the grid view edit columns, and we changed the field to a template field. So we've seen what the default behavior is, right? The default behavior is you go into edit mode, you pop open a text box, all right? No validation on it. You click update, it tries to use that field to update it, all right? So that's like the default behavior. That's what you get for free. All right? Remember, it's not a job of the framework to do everything for you. So it does that much, which for some things might work, right? You know, for middle initial, maybe that would work, right? Because can't require middle initial. You know, there's no duplicate constraints that two people can't have the middle initial, whatever. It's pretty much a freeform text field. So for that kind of thing, yeah, the default behavior works. But for other fields, like if it's required, or if it has to be a number, or it has to be within a certain range, or any number, it has to be a valid email address, then the default behavior probably doesn't cut it, because you want to validate that. All right? And if you can validate it before you try and do the update, that's good, because then you're not bothering the server with these statements that are doomed to fail. So in this case, with the required field, we converted it to a template column, went into the edit item template, and went and put our validation control. So after we've converted it to a template field, we can then go in here and edit templates, and we can see for that field department name, there's couple of 
different options that we could put in. And in our case, what we're really interested in is what happens when you go to edit it. So we go and change the edit item template. Now remember template fields, all right, because we're going to be using them again for another purpose, another specific purpose. In general, they're anytime you want to do something different than what the default behavior is. And we've seen the default behavior going to edit, as far as edit mode goes. You go into edit mode, if it's editable field, your label turns into a text box and there's no validation. Well, we might want the label that we might want a drop down instead of a text box, right? Or, or we might want some kind of validation. So those are two good reasons for us to convert to a template field. Then we can take control into our own hands and get it at the way we want to. The last thing which I continue to forget about is to confirm deletion. And I'm going to try to do this from memory. Typically, every semester I look it up, all right, because I probably do this once a year, uh, or actually twice a year, you know, spring and fall semester. But I think I've done it enough times that I remember it, so we'll see. All right. What I can do is I can't do it from memory. No, I can. I can. I, I know. It, I, I, I'm feeling it. All right. The problem is I wasn't listening to my own lecture two minutes ago. Right? <laughs> because if I was listening to my lecture two minutes ago, I would have realized that's because I, in my head I was going down the wrong path. All right? If I listen to my own self, though, what did I say a couple minutes ago? If you want to do something different from the default, you got to make a template. Well, does it confirm deletion by when you go to delete it? No. Well, what does that imply? It implies I have to go in and make a template column. All right. You following me? When I click delete, there's by default no confirmation comes up. It's gone. Or rather, it tries to delete it as soon as I click delete. All right. So, I don't want that to happen. I want a message box that pop up, pops up that says, are you sure you want to delete? I want to confirm the delete. So, that's not part of the default behavior of the framework. Therefore, what I need to do is go in and custom code this. So, because I want to custom code something associated with a grid view, I have to make it a template column. So I'll go in, edit this guy, and I'll take these command fields, which is the links to edit and delete, and I'll convert that into a template field. I'll then go and edit my templates, and if I look, We'll see I did something wrong. Take two. Edit columns, command field. Convert to template field. OK. Edit templates. There we go. I think what I did is, um, I, I, I think I hit cancel instead of OK or something. I didn't finish it out. I converted to a template column and then clicked OK. Alright. Now, this change I'm going to do in source view. And I'm going to find that delete link. That delete link is right here. Now, what do I want to have happen? I want, on the client side, to pop up a dialog, 
and ask if it's okay to do it, to do the deletion. So I'm going to do this on, on client click equals return confirm okay to delete Now let's go and run this. Okay to delete. Click cancel. Doesn't do anything. Click okay. And it's going to go and try and do it. It will fail, I think, because I have employees in the accounting department, but it will go and try to do the delete. All right. Now let's go and analyze this. What is confirm? Confirm is simply a built-in JavaScript function. It's built into the JavaScript language to pop up a dialog box that has OK and cancel as the two options. All right. The argument that you give it is the text that you want it to say. So OK to delete, you go and put it in there. So I call confirm OK to delete. Now this last part's a little tricky couple of things are a little tricky about this. I have to return the results of that confirm to the onClick event. All right? If I click OK that it's OK to delete, that function, that confirm function, returns a true. That tells the onClick event it's OK to go ahead and delete it, or try to delete it. If I click Cancel, then the onClick event or, or the confirm function returns a false, which tells the onClick event, hey, they really don't want to go through with this, and therefore it cancels the click. All right? It doesn't go and do what it needs to do. Now, notice that I don't have onClick. Why don't I have onClick? Well, because this is an ASP.NET server control. And if I said on click, it would assume I wanted to do some code on the server when I click that button. I don't want to do code on the server when I click that button. I want to do code on the client. I want to pop up a JavaScript alert. All right. Whole reason for this is I don't want to have to go back to the server. I want to do this client side so that if they, just, they change their mind, they can back out of it as quick as possible. So that's why it says on client click as opposed to on click. All right. So in effect, on client click means I want to do this in the browser. I want to do this client side. Confirm OK to delete means display a dialog that has an OK and cancel button. All right. I take the results of that, which are true if they've clicked OK and false if they've clicked cancel, and I return that to the on client click event, which means that if I clicked OK and it gets a true, it'll continue and, and go ahead and try to delete it. If I click cancel, um, it will um, return a false, which will stop the presses right, and not try to delete it. One of the toughest things, I think, sometimes about learning um, this sort of, of web programming is really understanding what's going on where and the fact that this is going on on the client side. And we want it to go on the client side because we want to ask that confirm prior to it going to the server. 
just like we want to do our validations prior to it going to the server. The idea is, is if they really don't want to delete it, if they change their mind, why even bother the server by sending it to the server and let it think about it? Or if they put in invalid data, why even bother um, the server with data that can't possibly um, lead to a successful update? Questions on this? All right. Let me see the next thing that we want to do. Can we do uh, inserts yet? Nope. Why haven't we done inserts yet? How could you answer that question without even being in class? Uh, that's a somewhat facetious statement. Because we haven't done details views yet, right? We haven't done details views with updates and deletes. And you can't do an insert on a grid view. So given that we've only talked to grid views by definition, we haven't talked about inserts. Now inserts, really you're going to see a lot of similarities between a, a details view and a grid view. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that uh, directly. Let's see. I'm going to work with this guy, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to set this guy to be my start page. All right. Could, yeah, go ahead. We had a discussion about this in lab the other day. We were confused. Um, if you, when you just did that, set that as start page, Yeah. does that mean that Whenever that website's accessed, no, it's whenever it's through this it session, and it's just a Visual Studio thing. So, no, this is just a convenience to me. Like, for example, you know, I know I'm working on this set of pages, the department search and the detail page that comes after it. So, if I'm looking at, if I like go to this page to look at something, and I run start. If I don't set a start page, it's going to call whatever page I'm looking at. If I do set a start page, it will call the one that I want. So I just do that just as sort of a convenience to myself. Okay. And if, does the, the home page have to be called default.aspx if you want to be able to? Um, This is one of those seemingly simple questions that, that it will take me a couple hours to answer. So <laughs> okay. if you want to go get a cup of coffee now, uh, go ahead. Um, the short answer is it's a pretty good idea because you'll be pretty safe it's going to work the way that you expect it to. So yeah. It doesn't have to be, but it's a pretty good idea, and you don't have to um, mess around with things to do that. That's the short answer. The long answer is that on a web server is defined a document or a list of documents that are called the default document. All right? So web servers have a root folder associated with them. All right? And... There's files in that root folder. And if I go to just any old web page, I go to www.lorraineccc.edu. Notice I don't specify a web page there. All right? Yet it displays a web page. How does it know what web page to display? Well, associated with that URL is a web server. And that web server is running some software that's listening for requests. And that web server has a default folder somewhere out on the disk. All right. It also has a list of pages to look for. And if you don't specify the specific page that you want as part of the URL, it will try to find one of those default pages until it does. Let's look at, I believe there's web server software running here. Let's go and look at the web server here. Let's 
forget about what we're doing through Visual Studio, right? Because through Visual Studio, I'm running the little development web server. Let's look at the actual web server software on here. All right. If I look for the default website here, I click on basic settings. All right. It tells me that the default folder for this, or the physical path for this, where it's going to start as like the root of this web server is CINETPUB www root. Might be hard to read, but that says system drive, which on our case is C, slash INETPUB slash www root. Okay? So that's where it's looking for stuff. So on this machine, that's here. See? INETPUB www root. Okay? So that is like ground zero for this website. This is the root folder for this website, for this web server. All right? So if I go and type localhost, you know, this machine doesn't have a, a domain name associated with it, right? Because no one from the outside world accesses the web server on this. But if I type in localhost, localhost means access the web server running on your own machine. So if I type in localhost, notice what happens. I get a page, which is probably this page right here. All right. How did it know to pull that page up? Well, it's kind of obvious in this case it's the only web page in that folder. But there could be other web pages in that folder, right? And it would still get it right. How does it know that? If we look for default document, here is where it looks for all of the pages. It'll go down until it finds one of these pages. So the first page it's going to look for is called default.htm. The second page it's going to look for is called default.asp, index.htm, index.html, iistart.htm. That's the one it found, if you remember, from the directory listing. So that's the page that it pulls up. So if I type localhost, all right, two things. If I type localhost, it says access the web server on this machine. So what does the web server do? Well, the web server knows to start looking for stuff in CINETPUB WW root. All right. So that's where it's going to start looking for stuff. Since I didn't give a page name, it's going to look through its list of default pages, default documents. And it will first look for default.htm, then it will look for default.asp, blah, 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 down the list until it finds, um, uh, until it finds one of them or it hits the end. All right. In this case, it found uh, iistart.htm, so that's a web page that gets displayed. So, to answer your question, when we run our development server, when we run our development server, we can't see these things about it, right? But the same sort of things happen, right? And if we don't give a page name, all right, what page does it pull up? Well, it runs down that list. You don't have a page called default.htm in your root. You don't have any of these pages. But if you did call default. If you did call your homepage default.aspx, it would use that one. All right. So it's a combination of the folder that's looking in and the list of these default pages. Now I can edit this, right? I could promote default.aspx to be on the top of the list. I could remove it. If I didn't like the name default.aspx, but I wanted to call my homepage home.aspx, I could add home.aspx onto this list of pages. But then whatever one it finds first, starting at the top, that's the page that's going to be the default page for that folder. All right? So if you were serving more than one website there, then under that folder here, you'd have folders for each. Like you have your HR date, your HR website. If you had the automobile website, would you? If you were truly running different sites, mm -hmm. you would actually have different sites set up on your server. So 
when we go into IIS, notice that we have default sites, default website. We only have one site underneath that. We could add a, a website if we wanted to, but then what we'd have to do is if we wanted to have a different website, we would have to associate that different website with a different root folder, its own root folder probably, and it would have to be listening on a different port, right? Because these requests come into a web server on a particular port, all right? Let's say this had a name. Let's say the name, let's say the domain name for this web server was bu205.com. So if I typed in bu205.com, that request is going to come into the web server. If there's multiple sites being served by that web server, how does it know which one to go to? Well, the only way it's going to know which site to pull up is it needs to differentiate based on port. So you'd have to put in then maybe my employee one is the default port 80. All right. Maybe my other one is some other port that I would make up that it could be listening for. All right. So to actually truly serve multiple sites on the same server, you'd have to use a different port between uh, the different sites. Now, you could have one big site that served up a variety of different web applications, and, and then you wouldn't need to do that. But if, if you're truly talking about serving up two different sites, then you do that. Then what you do, for example, is if I had, <clears throat> excuse me, if I had www.243.com and www.232.com, I, when I registered those domains, I'd point to my IP address, my server, and specify that maybe the 232 requests go to a different port. That way it could be physically on the same machine, but they would be two sites served from that machine, and the port would distinguish which site got the request. Bet you're wondering if you can go back and withdraw that question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> now, not to muddy it ever, uh, ever further, but there's also what you can do with subdomains. And subdomains don't require anything. They require essentially mapping uh, a subdomain to a folder. For example, um, if you go to AIM, you know, you could go to www.lorraineccc.edu, or you could go to angel.lorraineccc.edu. And again, that's not necessarily a different server or anything. It could be, but not necessarily, but it's a subdomain. All right, and, and uh, you know, it, it will correspond to a folder, a virtual folder on, on the web server. I'm not sure if it would have to live on the same server or not. That's a good question. But we have a lot of subdomains here, right? We have Angel, we have My Campus, we have, there's an apps, one apps.lorraineccc.edu, and so on. All right. Grid view, or details view. Let's go back here. And I want to change this details view to allow editing of this guy. All right. So, what do I need to do? I need to do kind of the same thing that I did with the, with the grid view, right? The procedure is going to be the same. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to configure my data source. And I'm going to go in and create an update statement that will say something like, actually let me create it this way. 